But I was just talking to Bruce. This is just sort of a, an aside. Uh, I was just talking to Bruce in the break, and we, he was just asking, you know, when, when, when many people read the Book of Truths, you, you know, like the pageant messages or the Book of Truths, they have this emotional openness that they feel grief and sorrow just automatically flow as they're reading the messages. It's like quite a beautiful process if you fully allow it. And that's wonderful because you're actually receiving divine love while you're reading and you're open, your soul is open and everything is just really wonderful in that place. And it can cause a lot of growth by actually reading those kind of books. Um, however, as I pointed out too, in your day-to-day -day life, there will be events that connect you with emotions of anger, frustration, annoyance. Now, those three or four emo those emotions that are all revolving around anger or rage-based emotions, they're like a doorway, a guide to the fact that in your day-to-day -day life you're in resistance to love. So we can actually get into a higher state by reading the pageant messages and reading the Book of Truths. We can be open, crying, and let yourself feel the emotions. All of that's fantastic and don't give it up because it's really... Like I've, I've read them myself 15 times and every time I read them I have that response. Right? But, but don't go into this place in your day-to-day -day life of then resisting the fact that you have all of these addictions in play. Because the addictions are still there, present in your day-to-day -day life. So that's telling you you're yet to release those particular addictions. Whenever you feel anger, frustration, annoyance and so forth, you're yet to release them. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so do the things that make you feel open to God. Don't stop doing them. But, but actually also you need to embrace some work on dealing with and recognizing the addictions that drive this other f the frustration anger and annoyance and so forth feelings that you have let yourself find them as well if you don't find them you will receive divine love to a certain point and you just will not receive any more you'll get enough divine love to a, to a degree and then you will stagnate now i've known people who have known about the pageant messages read them every single day and have done so for 30 years but for the last 28 or 29 of those years, they've never received divine love. Because in their day-to-day -day life, they're not looking at their addictions and resistance. That's what they're doing. And we've got to be quite honest with ourselves if we're going to do that. If we're going to, you know, we, we all at some point get into stagnation. And when we're in stagnation, we've got to realise, wow, this is me and my addiction. And if we can do that, it's very, very positive. Okay, well, let's uh, focus on the discussion at hand, shall we? This discussion is a lot more positive, I feel, uh, rather than talking about our emotions. The relationship with God is the series of talks that, uh, um, that myself and Mary are wanting to uh, talk about. Uh, there's a whole number of talks that we want to give in this series of talks. And this particular one we want to talk about is the world's definition of God. Now, if I can clarify what we're going to talk about in this particular discussion first. We're not going to talk about whether God exists or not. Right? That's a complete different discussion in itself, uh, which we'd love to have at some point with you. We're not going to discuss um, things like the different belief systems on the earth, to a degree, about God ranging from there is no God to God is dead, to God doesn't care right the way through to there is a God who cares and loves you. We, we're not, I'll be referring to those things, but I'm not going to discuss every one of those subjects in much detail because other talks that we give on this subject of relationship with God will address those particular issues. What we want to say to you, and uh, what I've done is I've printed up a little outline for this that I might finish up loading up on the website because... There's some very, very interesting things to watch on YouTube, trust me, about the subject of the world's definition of God. Now, I don't want to write down all the codes to them, unless you want them. Do you want them or, you know, we can put them on a blog or something like that. I'm not going to discuss the contradictions in the Bible, but on Mary's blog there will be a link to some very interesting 
what we call humorous um, things presented on YouTube about the contradictions in the Bible. Does that make sense? We're not going to talk about so much about the contradictions about God in terms of um, uh, in terms of humor, humor or anything like that. We are definitely going to talk about the contradictions in God in this session. But there are some interesting things on YouTube that list a lot of the contradictions that are found in holy books about God. And there is also some very interesting things and points in YouTube that are raised about my own death and, and God's actions uh, in a humorous manner. But some of them not so humorous. Some of them are just quite direct uh, presentations. And my suggestion is to have a look at some of those presentations. They contain a lot of truth. And we're not going to look at all of the contradictions in the holy books because the reality, unfortunately, is that many of the so-called holy books contain many contradictions within each of their books. And uh, we're going to look at some of the contradictions that refer to God, but not the contradictions that are there about other subjects. Does that make sense? And there are literally hundreds of subjects on which these holy books contradict themselves. So we're not going to discuss that. We are, however, going to refer to a degree to whether we can trust the holy books, the Bible, the Koran and other books like that, whether we can trust them as being God's word. And, uh, and one of the primary things I would like to state at the outset is this. If a book does not accurately describe God's true nature, then my suggestion to you is that that book cannot be trusted as being God's word. Now that makes sense to you, does it? If a book does not accurately describe God's true nature, then the book cannot be trusted as being God's word. Now, myself and Mary receive many emails in the course of a, of a day, um, often, that come from, uh, you would call them perhaps religious people who are upset about my claims and Mary's claims and who are upset with us about different aspects about God and so forth. And they wish to debate with me and they often send quite uh, derogatory emails to me saying, that they wish to debate to me, the general theme is that they wish to debate with me from the Bible whether what I am saying can be the truth or not. And I put to you and everybody who comes along and presents that to me, that if you wish to debate with me about a book that is automatically and can be proven to be illogical and is also misrepresentative of the very God you're wanting to debate with me about, then I put to you, relying on that book as a source of information is flawed from the outset in its logic. And it's pointless me engaging with any person who does not or is not open to the, to the irregularities, misrepresentations and complete contradictions that are contained within a book that they're trying to argue with. So it's pointless having a discussion about the Bible and whether the Bible says I could be standing in front of you, Jesus could be standing you in front of you on earth or not, based on what the Bible says, when that exact same Bible presents a God that is totally not the God I know. It is a totally different God. And I suggest a God that doesn't actually exist is presented by many of these books. Now, I can be more precise than that, and that is there are many truths contained in the holy books. And I'm not saying there is no truth in these books. However, I am saying that these books cannot be relied upon, upon as the word of God because they do not accurately present God. It's a very basic statement that I'm making. If a book does not accurately present God, then it cannot be relied upon as being God's word. Simple as that. 
And if, it's not, can, if it cannot be relied upon as being God's word, then how can we use it in our logical discussion about the truth of the universe or the truth about God? It's very, very flawed logical reasoning to do so. That being said, I've brought a Bible along with me so we can talk about some of the different things that uh, are in it about God. But before we do, I want to raise with you two or one primary thing that is important to realise with regard to every book that's ever been written about God. And it's this. The emotions that children have towards their parents are imposed upon God. Does everyone get that? The reason why we can accept what something like the Bible says about God is because it describes a parent that is not very different to our own. And since it describes a parent that is not very different to our own parent, we can accept that this must be the truth about God. And I put to you that's not the case. God is better than any person on earth. Now, the Bible portrays a genocidal maniac as God. There is a record, if you add up all the people the Bible says God destroyed, this is not the ones with it that don't have numbers. Like, for instance, the Bible does say God destroyed the people at Noah's day, but it doesn't give how many. It says he wiped out all the creatures, all the animals and all the humans aside from Noah and his family. That's what it says. Now... That's genocide. And if God chose to do that, then God is a genocidal maniac. But even with that, it doesn't say how many people died. If you just record all the things in the Bible that say how many people died, God murdered over 2,400,000 people recorded in the Bible. Now, if a ruler on this planet murdered, because those people would not follow his rules, murdered 2,400,000 2, people, what would you call him? A dictator. Would you not? Right? And I suggest to you, God is not a dictator. Right? So the Bible portrays a God that does not exist. It does portray many parental emotions that do exist, unfortunately, but not in God. Unfortunately, they exist in the world that we see. In other words, it becomes the world's definition of God. That's what's actually happening. The Bible portrays a God who is selfish, petty, unforgiving, unmerciful, and unloving. And I'm going to show that to you today. And this is one of the reasons why there is so much confusion on the earth about God. There is so much confusion because even the so-called holy books that are meant to portray God accurately and are meant to be God's word, they portray a God that doesn't exist and they portray a person who is worse 
than the average person on earth in their emotional state. And I'm going to show you how it portrays that in, that, in this discussion. Mary, you want to... I just have a question, babe. Mm -hmm. So we're all coming along here and listening to you for however long we all have been. Mm -hmm. why, why are you talking to us about the Bible today? Because the world's definition of God is proclaimed to have come from many of these holy books, like the Koran and the Bible. And since the world's definition of God has come from them, we now must examine them to examine what kind of God these books portray. So even if we've never picked up a Bible, this has been a part of our culture. This has been a part of our, our culture and our life. And yep. so, so the unfortunate thing is, I, I should have brought along another book that I bought just recently. Um, what was it called again? It was called The God, the God Fallacy. Very good book. Written by an atheist. Right? So I can't agree with his assumptions that God doesn't exist. However, a lot of the things he says in the book are definitely true. Right? And my suggestion is to have a, have a look at the book, The God Fallacy, it's called. I forget the name of the writer. But what I, what I feel is that I am in complete harmony with many atheists that I meet about religion and about religion's definition of God. But I put to them that many of them are actually atheists because they are thinking that women that religion's view of God is the correct view of God. And this is not a very logical assumption either. How can we say that the religions that have come across, man, across the earth over literally thousands of years, through which a lot of these books arrive, can have accurately portrayed God when, let's face it, the majority of us have emotions as children towards our own parents that we're now seeing as God. We're seeing God to be. So um, one other thing I'd like to clarify at the beginning of the discussion is that I actually love the Bible and I love the Koran. But I do not agree that they are God's word. And it becomes very evident when you start looking at the different things that are said about God that they cannot be God's word. Because a book that portrays God accurately can only, or inaccurately, can only be man's word in the end of the day. However, in the Bible and the Koran and many other holy books, there is a large degree of truth that you can find. The problem is sorting out the truth from the error. But the reality is that although that may seem to be a problem, it's actually quite simple. And that is, if you base everything on love, you will soon see what's the error. Because that's the way we can test everything, whether it's loving or not. So what we want to do is I'm going to present some verses that I've written down and present some ideas to you about what God is and why there is so much confusion about God. So the world's definition of God, as you probably are aware, many of you have probably spent much of your life even trying to discover what God is, let alone... And, and many of us, in fact, have given up the process of discovering what God is because it seems so convoluted and there seems to be so many varying opinions. And so in the end, we just give up. Well, nobody, we finish up saying, nobody knows. We'll just wait and see. And we hope that when we pass, we'll be able to see. And then you start talking to some spirits, and then you realize they don't see either what God is. So passing doesn't help understanding God. And in fact, many spirits are just as confused about God as we are here on earth. Even though they realize there is no such thing as death, they then still have just as much confusion about the reality or the, the discussion about what God is. So let's uh, start with some of these different perceptions that the world have, which I'd call contradictions. 
the new age people, if I can call them that. By the way, I've been called the new, a new age person and I can't uh, agree that I am a new age person because, uh, well, besides the fact I'm 2,000 years old, but, <laughs> but because, <laughs> because I can't agree with a lot of the philosophies. And in fact, I, I, while I love the new age movement in the sense that I feel that it has opened up mankind to the possibility of spirit interaction, and it's opened mankind up to a lot of very good concepts that the, that, that the religions generally have shut down man towards. And the reality is also, unfortunately, that the New Age concept of God is perhaps its largest flaw. So let's just mention the New Age concept of God. What's the New Age concept of God? I am God. God is energy. God is the universe. Of course, logically, there's a lot of flaws already, is there not? What we're basically saying that I am equal to God, and that's equal to I am the universe. So that means I am the universe as well. Do you feel like the universe at this point in time? <laughs> or do you feel like a person who exists in the universe at this point in time? Which one? You don't certainly feel like the universe at this time, do you? So, I, God, and the universe are equal and are one. Oh, that sounds very interesting. There's a few other things that are said to be at one with God or one with God. But uh, the reality, obviously, is there is no logic in this. None whatsoever. And what, what is I find outstanding on the earth is how totally illogical things can be presented and then through the mind and the use of words then be accepted as a logical possible argument on which to base the rest of your life. Don't you find that funny? That we're willing to go through this process of actually doing these mental gymnastics just in order to avoid the fact that we don't know the truth. We'd rather know the truth, even if it's a lie, and call it the truth, We'd rather do that than actually understand the truth. It would be far better to say, I've got no idea about God, than it would be to say, I am equal to God, and that's equal to the universe. And I, therefore, I'm saying I am the universe. And honestly, I feel that's definitely proven to be incorrect. I am existing in the universe. That is definitely correct. So that's the New Age movement. Now, the, the Bible, so what does the Bible say about this same subject? Well, the Bible says this. I'll just uh, read you from the book of Job this time. It says, One day the angels came to present themselves before God, and Satan also came with them. Now, if you can stand before somebody... What is that saying? They're an entity, aren't they? A being, someone who you can be before. And it says, God said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has in your hand is in your hands, but do not but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So the Bible is saying that Satan talked to God. Right? So therefore, God can hold a conversation. Right? It's not just a force or an energy. So the Bible is actually saying, and I'm not saying whether it's true or not at this point, but the Bible is saying that God is an entity. Right? And that God speaks in some manner. Let's, let's not define it too closely, but... Obviously that God is someone you can stand before or there is a personage of God. Right? So it might not be a man like we are, but there is an entity, a person, a being that the Bible display or talks about as being God. Now can you see straight away there's a lot of confusion here. One movement is saying that I am God and you are God, and the other movement is saying, no, 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 that's all wrong. 
the reality is that God is an entity or a, or, or a being. Right? And so we have religious movements on the planet, of which, of which there are quite substantial movements, saying that God is a being. And then you have other movements on the planet that are saying God is totally the opposite of that. There's no such thing as a being of God. I am a part of God. God makes up. All of us individually are fragments of God. So we have completely contradictory information about what even God is. So can you see straight away, how can I... How can I connect to a God that I have no idea of their or, or concept, even an intellectual concept, that's accurate because I've been influenced by all these different forms? Now, this New Age form came from and originated in generally the Eastern philosophies. Now, when I say the Eastern philosophy, I'm talking primarily about the Buddhist and Hindu philosophies about God. So those came from that area and then these ones came from all this concept of God being a punishing a father sort of figure and these processes all came from there. How do I determine the reality? How do I know what the truth is from that? Because we've got all this contradictory information. It's no wonder the world's confused about God, hey? Because you get all this contradictory information. And, and it's so bad that the people who believe this one are totally willing to fight the people who believe this one. Like, if there was love, would you be willing to fight somebody with a different belief than you have? But they do. They fight them. They'll go to war with them. There's been genocides as a result. Inquisitions as a result of these different belief systems being imposed or forced upon another. Whole races of humans have been exterminated as a result. Or, I should say, the excuse has been used for extermination of whole range of humans, of, of races, because they didn't have the right belief. Now that doesn't place too much confidence in us about any of the beliefs being true, does it? if we're honest about that. So here we have those two beliefs. Now, what is the truth? Now, we can say the truth, what the truth is, but there's got to be a way to test it, doesn't there? There has to be a way to test it. So while we can say the truth, we do not expect any individual who hears the presentation to then assume that that is the truth. We're suggesting that they can test through a process whether this is true or not. And that process is independent of any holy book and the process is independent of any religion and in the independent of any mediator. Which means that it has a higher degree of accuracy than any other possible process. So the truth is, let's state the truth, that God is an entity. With characteristics and attributes. The greatest of which as far as we know at this point, is love. Now I say the greatest of which we know at this point because nobody has discovered the full extent of God yet. And so therefore we can only assume that the thing that seems to be the greatest attribute appears to be love at this point. But we can only say that because it only seems to be based on what we've discovered at this point. Now I put to you another truth, and that is if God created the universe and God created all humanity on every planet, then God must be quite a powerful being. Now we often refer to the universe as infinite in nature. Therefore God must be greater than the universe's infinite nature for God to create such a universe. 
And for me then, as a finite being, to discover God is going to take a process of time. I can't expect to just ask the question, get the answer, without me understanding the full extent of everything in between. And that is a process that we need to engage. So I put to anybody that you cannot fully describe God until you begin to engage the process God has designed for you to engage to get to know that God. And that's the process of receiving divine love, the process of becoming born again. Now that process will, through its practice, enable you to discover more and more of God until you get to a point where you know for certain God's existence and you know for certain many of God's characteristics and attributes. But the world's definition of God prevents... This one is like, this one is like an angry father definition of God, right? And this one is saying that God doesn't really exist except we are all God or all a part of God or the universe is God. Both of those world definitions of God, because of their nature, are impossible to accurately test. The, the only definition of God that's going to turn out to be true is the definition of God that can be accurately tested in a scientific method that can be described. Does that not make sense to you? In other words, there is a scientific method that can be described that will eventually enable you to connect to the truth about God and this applies to all things in the universe. We can experiment with everything in the universe to find out its truth as long as we know the proper experiment. That's the key thing. We need to know the proper experiment in order to do so. And what I'm suggesting to you is experiments will prove this to be untrue and they will prove this to be untrue and eventually prove this to be true. Mary, you want to ask? Yeah. Sorry, babe. Like there's a lot of Christians on the planet who would say that they are using that experiment and that they have evidence for the fact that there is an angry God because things happen that seemingly punish people for their sin. Mm -hmm. And they would say that they speak... See, to I would argue that that's incorrect. Why is it that... The Bible itself says, actually, that many people who are so-called wicked by the definition of the Bible get away with all sorts of things. There are many people on the planet right now who've gotten away with blasphemy, gotten away with adultery, gotten away with murder, gotten away with fornication. These are all things condemned in the Bible. Um, but, they, but lots and lots of people on earth are all getting away with it. Now, the Christian so answer is... So they would say, that's grace, that's God's mercy and grace. No, they? they wouldn't say that because what they don't they believe say? they're going to get away with it. What they believe instead is that the angry God will have a day of judgment where all of those things that have been done will then be punished at some point. That's yep. what they believe. And I put to them that a God who is infinitely just, infinitely merciful and infinitely lo loving um, and infinitely understanding and infinitely intelligent does not need to kill any of the c persons he creates because all he needs to do is correct them. He doesn't need to kill them. He needs to correct them. And the reality is, if we were a parent who had a way a lawless child, would we want to kill them or correct them? What would we want? To correct them, surely. Now, what we're basically saying is that God doesn't want that. God only wants to kill them. He doesn't want to correct them. Right? And he, we're also saying that that this God is incapable of correcting them without finishing up killing them. Basically, that's what we're saying. And, and then the religions even go further, though. They say, killing them isn't enough. Because what we want to do then, because they've been bad people, because they've done all of these different things that we condemn, killing them isn't enough. What we're going to do now is we're going to place them in a place of eternal torment for what they have done. 
Now I put to you, no matter how bad your son or daughter becomes, would you firstly kill them and then secondly, realising that they're still alive, which seems to be pointless killing them, realising they're still alive, place them in a place where they'll be tormented in pain and torture for the rest of their existence. Would you do that? It doesn't sound like a very loving thing to do, does it? And in fact, I put to you that the majority of people on earth would not choose to do that, right, in the end. They would choose to do something different if they had the option. And I put to you that God, being an entity with unlimited resources and an unlimited intellect, would know what the options are, other than doing that very base thing that most of humanity actually condemns. And what about people who say, uh, Christians, who say that um, God speaks to them through their relationship with you? They pray to you and they actually hear answers. And isn't that proof of their experiment? Well, the unfortunate thing is that uh, they certainly do hear answers and sometimes the answers are coming from, from spirits who are God's representatives. Other times the answers are coming from spirits who are not God's representatives. Because, you know, if they, uh, many Christians have said, oh, we went to war because we got this guidance from God that we should go to war. That's George Bush said That's that. George Bush who said that recently, right? Now, in the last 10 years. Now, this, saying, this is basically saying that God is telling a person on earth that the genocide or the, or the punishment of another human race through violence is acceptable. And I say to you, well, that, that certainly portrays one kind of God, but not the God that I know. And it's certainly not the God that, that I taught in the first century. And it's certainly not the God that actually exists. So instead, those kind of guidances must come from another source, an evil source, a source that wants to create more violence on the planet. That's the reality. So how can we know then? Is it through a measure of love? This is how I feel we can know. It's a very basic explanation. I have a level of love inside of my own heart already that tells me that to kill another person is a, a wrong act. The majority of you feel the same, do you not? And let's face it, the majority of people on earth must feel the same because otherwise there wouldn't be a law against murder. Can we be agreed on that? Well, if there is a law against murder, that tells me that the majority of people on the planet obviously disagree with murder. And murder basically is me selfishly thinking that I have the right to determine whether another person lives or dies for anything that they've done. That's murder, isn't it? And me thinking I have the right to kill them under any circumstance. Now, we then, as humanity, justify the circumstance, but every person's justification is different. So some people feel it's okay to kill a person just because they disobey you. Stalin, Hitler, <laughs> and all of the genocidal people that have, that have lived on Earth it, who have been a part of the ruling system have believed that. But that feeling really feels abhorrent, does it not, inside of my own soul? Now, if it feels abhorrent inside of my own soul to act in that way, and I know that that's not loving, then surely the God who created me must have more love in him or her than I do. Does not that make logical sense? If the God has more love in them than I have in me, then surely that God would be just as shocked of a person's desire to murder as I would be. Would they not? And while they may understand the underlying emotions that cause the person to revert to murder, they would certainly not justify it, and neither would they justify their own killing of millions of people in the process. If I have a certain degree of love within me, then if there is a God that exists, that God must have more love than I have. If that God created my being, my, even my physical body, 
which is an amazing apparatus that mankind cannot reproduce, that God must have supreme amounts of intelligence. And if, he, if that God is intelligent and also is able to give me the gift of feeling love, then surely that God must have more love than I and more intelligence than I. And my, my anal analyzing that God through my own limited intelligence, even in a way, provides a lot of limitation upon the analysis. I'm trying with my finite brain to understand an infinite being who gave me the gift of love that I don't understand but I feel. And I'm trying with my limited mind to understand an infinite being who created an infinite universe, most of which I do not understand with my own mind. And yet at the same time, I judge that infinite being as being less in love than myself. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't make any sense to me, logically. So my answer to people who believe that God is an angry father um, is that there is a lot of logic to prove that God is not such a being. Don't know. Does our inability to understand God um, have a big impact on why we have these other beliefs? We, we don't want to actually well, feel... Does not it also make sense from a logical perspective that God would create children that cannot understand God? It doesn't, does it? Right? My suggestion is the only reason why we cannot understand God is because we're trying to apply the wrong rules to God. And so therefore it's impossible for us to understand God. We are only going to be able to understand God when we connect to God in the manner which God designed for us to connect to God. Then of course we will understand God. And there are people in the universe who understand immense amounts of information about God. Does that make sense? But not everything because God has yet to have a lot of parts of his or her characteristics and attributes discovered. But they understand much more than what we understand here on earth generally about God. And the more we connect to God through this process that I believe a logical God would definitely create. Um, and this is how I reasoned in the first century. Many people ask me why I even decided to long for love. Why I even decided to long for this connection with this God. When I applied logic to the question of God... In the first century, I realized that there was no logic on earth about God. None whatsoever. It was all just imposed upon mankind's belief about their parents, actually, mostly, or acceptable systems of religion, which were all about control. They weren't about God. And logically, I was thinking about the, my own nature and my own characteristics and thinking, well, if, if I was created by a being then logically that being must have more love than I, more intelligence than I, more understanding than I, more wisdom than I, more justice than I, more everything than I. And me assuming that such a being would be less than I am is such an absurd proposition that it makes no logical sense to even believe it. So I don't believe that God created us to not understand God. God did not create a mystery, mysterious process for us to understand God. However, God did create a process to understand God. And all that was needed was to discover that process. And, and for me, in the first century, the reason why I discovered it is because to me it made so much logical sense that, that God would create a very simple process, something that any person in any level of intelligence on the planet from a young child that you could teach at two years of age would, un would understand if you present it to them. Something that's so simple, so logical and so easy that any person of his own children could, could engage this process of getting to know God. And so all I did was assume, in the, in in the first instance, in the first century, I just assumed that I could engage this very simple process and I'd see what happened. And as I engaged the process and saw what happened and felt the changes within me and felt God's love enter me and felt the different adjustments that came as a result, now I knew for certain that my assumption was correct. 
just like any scientist would make an assumption and then perform an experiment and then come to a conclusion based on the experiments that have been performed. That's all I did. I just happened to be the first person to think about doing that for some reason, which I still don't understand. <laughs> because I don't understand that such a logical thing could be misrepresented and misplaced by the human race. I still don't understand that. Can I just say one more thing from that? Mm -hmm. So, because like intellectually, like it does, I can get the logic of it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'm feeling then that it, it's my resistance to my, um, to really like knowing and wanting to know my emotional addictions that really is in, is in um, the way of. Well, I feel yes. Yeah, knowing it, the truth. It's not so much your resistance uh, from or your emotional from your emotional addictions. They do have a part. But the resistance comes from another, a number of sources, not just your emotions. Your resistance comes from your environment. Your resistance comes from also the belief systems that you've imbibed from the environment. So, for example, if I have a belief system that there is only an angry father for me to connect to, who wants to connect to an angry father? So I'm going to avoid the process. If I have a belief system that this angry father will punish me for something that I feel ashamed of doing in the past, that I know was wrong, then I'm going to have resistance to connect to this angry father. Not just, it, they're all emotional, but they're all based on belief systems as well. If I also have a feeling inside of myself that I can't bear my own emotions and I need to connect to my father through an emotion, then of course I'm going to have resistance to that process as well. So I realized that while the process was simple, that a little baby child could understand, it wasn't going to be that easy because the world around us has completely different concepts. And the world doesn't like giving up its concepts <laughs> at all. And why were these concepts created? Well, the concepts of religion were created primarily for one purpose, and that was to control, to control the masses. You know, statements made by atheists about religion being the opium of the people are very correct. That's the reality. It's a way of controlling groups of people, not enabling their free will. So, of course, I'm going to look at this God and think, well, this God doesn't want me to have my will. He wants me to give up my will for his will. Do you want to connect to such a God? I don't know about you, but I don't want to connect to such a God. So, of course, I'm going to have resistance. To that process. So all of the resistances are really our resistance to truth, our resistance to love, our resistance to our own coping of our own emotions that are based around the environment in which we've grown. The world has nurtured confusion about God so that we all remain disconnected from this being. And why did they want to be, be disconnected? Because if you connect to a being that you then feel is your desire to be connected to, you are no longer going to be, in your own mind, self-determinant. Right? You are going to feel that somebody else might have some more information that will help you determine what's going to go on in your life. And... You know, mankind is so, so hell-bent on being self-reliant that we're willing to completely deny a God and we're willing to create huge confusion about what that God is in order to justify our own self-reliance. Remember I've once said to you as a group that self-reliance is the biggest single injury within mankind. It was created right at the beginning of mankind's process, of mankind's progress. And, and it remains within the human race to such an extent today that the majority of humans have no desire to connect to God, not because this God cannot be proven through logic to exist and not because this God is proven through logic to be loving, but because... Mankind wants self-reliance. That's one of the biggest injuries. 
shall we proceed with further things about God? So that's God's basic underlying characteristic, if you like. God is an entity with characteristics and attributes, one of which, or the primary one of which that's been discovered at this point, is the attribute of love. And I put to you that we cannot have within ourselves an emotion that does not exist within our creator. And what I mean by that is we cannot have the potential of an emotion of that's like things like love. I'm not talking about damaging emotions. If you look at the damaging emotions, they are all about self-determination. I'm talking about emotions that are that are based around love. We cannot have a certain degree of love with our parent, our other, our greatest parent, the Creator, having more love than we have. Does that make sense to everyone? It's impossible to to actually have love to that extent. Now, a lot of people then in the New Age movement go, yes, and that being the case means that if we have anger and rage, then God must have more anger and rage than we have. Well, I put to you that there are some things that God created and there are other things that man created and the two aren't the same. Right? And, and a loving and, a, and an intelligent person would certainly not create anger. And to be frank with you, every time you're angry, you're not being very intelligent. Do you get that? Well, you think about what anger does. What does it do? It often harms others. It's often murderous. It's often, you know, it often harms other people's free will all the time, generally harms other people's free will. It is a terrible feeling that exists inside of ourselves. It feels terrible to experience, and yet we create it within ourselves. And I put to you, that's not a very logical thing to do. It's far more logical to look at the addiction that creates the anger than it is to actually stay in the anger. Now, that's what I can work out with my own limited, feeble logic. Surely God knows that. <laughs> Surely God knows that anger is a pointless and useless emotion that's totally, that drives terrible, unloving actions. That's what I know. Surely God must know the same thing. Does that not make sense? And if God knows the same things, then why would anger exist within God? It doesn't make any sense logically to me that anger does. But let's have a talk about some of the things that are presented. Um, just following that logic, um, I, is, I know what I believed before was erroneous, but... It was first believing in the Bible mm -hmm. and then realising that it was all um, bullshit, so to say. Right. Um, because I got really upset with... The I don't feel the Bible is all bullshit. No, but no. I did. Yep, I, I got understand. really upset. Yeah, A lot of people punish the Bible yeah. for leading them down a path yeah. that they, through their own free will, chose to take. Yeah. Now, that's not very logical either. No. <laughs> But, but, on. but I really believed it and then I went against it yep. and then I looked for something and because I felt that the Bible was so illogical, yep. I then went to the New Age path of uh, the yogic, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, everything. And if I listen to what you say, there it was a lot of logic in what how they presented it all because if we have the same attributes as God, then we... God and you know all that what you've said and I can see how I got involved in it. Mm -hmm. I agree. I'm you not. Know? I'm not saying that we should be ashamed of ourselves for getting involved in different religious pursuits. What I am saying is that when you apply logic fully to a particular discussion, you can see its flaws quite easily. And this is why a lot of people are atheists because what they do is they look at the New Age movement, apply a lot of logic to it, see the flaws. Therefore, I can't believe that. Then they look at the Christian movement and they apply a logic to it, see a lot of its flaws, can't believe that. Then they look at the Islam movement, the Muslim movement, and they apply a lot of logic, see its flaws, can't believe in that. Then they look at the Hindus and the Buddhists and, and they apply a lot of logic in all these different areas and can't see the logic in it. And so they then, what do they then do? They then assume there can't be a God. Well, I, I don't see that as a logical extension of that complete argument. That's the difference. Yeah, what I was saying for myself was that if I hadn't um, heard you speak, 
I would have applied what I thought was still logical mm -hmm. and stayed in that path. Mm -hmm. um, how do people who don't hear you speak or know this, d can they come to the logic themselves that what they are actually following is not logical? Because I didn't come to that. Well I, well, I find that it's very hard to do that because remember I began this conversation with the fact that we have, we have applied a lot of the principles of God because of the different beliefs we have about our parents. And because of the world's definition of love that we've grown, or the world's definition of God that we've grown up in, it's very, very hard for us then to apply logic that isn't somehow emotionally influenced. Does that make sense to everyone? So the majority of people, when they're applying logic to a situation, do not realize the emotional influence that's influencing their logic. Right? And since they don't understand the emotional influence upon their logic, they then take logical conclusions that, can't, that are not necessarily true. For instance, this man that I read the book, The God Fallacy, the book, uh, I was just reading a bit of it last night, and he was saying, he was talking about my life, and he was saying how I was the instigator of monetary-based religion, right? because my followers instigated a monetary-based religion. Now, he, he's trying to apply logic to a situation that he does not know, and it's very, very hard to apply logic to something when you haven't got all of the facts. The fact is that I didn't promote a money-based religion at all. In fact, I, was quite, I felt quite the opposite about a money-based religion. I do believe that gifts and can be received and given. However, that is totally up to the individual's pur purpose. He was saying that I was promoting the tithe, uh, which was a, a Judaism-based a Judaism process. Um, and and he, he felt that as a result of that, I was the instigator of a lot of the badness that came about because of the instigation of the monetary-based religion. Now, I don't see the extension of that argument. And this is what often happens on earth, is that we have the world's thing, arguments presented to us uh, without knowing all the facts. And I do believe you have to find out all the facts, if it's possible. And if you don't know all the facts, then it's best not to make a decision upon that matter until you have know, know all the facts. But once you do know the facts, then you can start applying the truth to those facts and, and start coming up with the actual answers. And I feel that's what we're capable of doing with logic. Now, unfortunately, for the majority of people, when they apply logic, they apply logic through a lot of emotional filters. And so, therefore, their logic isn't logical. All right? Yep. It feels to me that love is very logical. Um, mm -hmm. it, it always leads us into logic um, if we have a correct understanding of love. But what it feels like to me is that most... The, the issue on the planet is that people don't have a, a good... I'm very much an audience member today, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, people don't have a good understanding of what love is uh, em, from an emotional perspective. Well, I, I don't I know, know whether I could even agree well. with that. I yeah, know. because the, the reality is that uh, the average person in their day-to-day -day life does feel when things feel unloving. It's the avoidance of owning that truth then, isn't it? That Exactly. Yeah. So I feel that it's more about the denial of love yeah. and therefore the denial of truth. Denial of pain, is it? Yeah, because and all of those kind of things, rather than it is about the fact that the average person doesn't know. So if my parent hurts me and says that they love me, I can feel that that's not love. Exactly. But because I don't want to face the pain of my parent not loving me, I accept that it is love. Exactly. And therefore, then when I enter a relationship with God or I decide I'm going to discover about God, yep. I can explain away issues of unlovingness as love because I'm still avoiding that primary pain with of, my parents. With my parent, yep. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So while I'm trying to apply a logical to the, to the God-based relationship, I'm not realising at the same time that I haven't even been logical about my parent in a relationship. Because it seems I can say, it's logical. My parents hit me and that's the way I learnt how to and they not loved do... And they they love me and that's how I learnt. Yep. So I can say, well, it's logical that God would do something that hurts me and that yep. would be love. And the, and the reality is that the time that you were punished when you were hit by your parents, you didn't feel loved. You felt terrified, scared 
and abused. But it is this, it's this very issue that we have to conquer, isn't it? It's, a, it's an, a willing, an allowance of our own pain yes. and a recognition of truth. Well, a recognition of actually being able to identify the truth of our own pain, yeah. like what its source was. You see, most of the time we are in complete avoidance, aren't we, of what the source is of our own pain. Many of us are still grappling with the idea that our parent didn't love us. We, we want to believe our parent must have and yet they belted us, violently treated us in some way, and many of us have done the same thing with our own children, still justifying that we loved them. Uh, and I put to you, that's not love. Yep. So, so that's the main issue with the world's... Yeah, the main definition. issue with the world's definition of God is that they have all of these parental emotions in play, which they then impose upon God using the same logic they have with the parents. And the problem with that logic is that it's flawed. Because when, when we become adults, it's like I said yesterday when we we're adults, like if a man comes up and punches you on the nose, you can actually go to a police station, report him, and if there's more than two witnesses to the, to the act, he can go to jail for what he did to you, and yet a parent can punch the, their child on the nose any time they like. And it's not called assault. And that there's something wrong with our reasoning, because logically if it's an assault for a, an adult, then it surely must be an assault and even a worse one for the child. And yet we're not logical. We're not even applying logic to that situation. And so what we then do is we start treating God in the same manner as we've treated our parents. Yeah. I can just... I can. Well, oh. One mic just yeah. ran out of a battery. Um, oh no, it's back. I can just um, feel I can feel the audience is just grappling a little bit mm -hmm. with what's being presented, which I think is good. But f for me, um, I can connect to God, loving a loving God that it just feels so um, logical to me. Um, I, I guess because I'm reincarnated, maybe that's not a hard. Well, I, I feel partly it's because mankind on earth still stops this logical reasoning. They believe that they have more love than God does. Or that God is somehow like, would reason like them. Well, God might reason like us, we don't know. Yeah. But to, to actually then assume that God has less love than we do when God created us and we have love within ourselves makes no logical sense. So if there is a God that exists, the God must have more love than I do. Otherwise, where did my love come from? Like, how, how you look at the animals and other, other creatures without mankind, you know, a, a, an animal will eat its own child. I don't feel like ever doing that. There's been cases in history where people have done it, but, I'm not, but there is also cases in people where, pe where people have been totally selfless, which is a totally illogical act from an evolutionary perspective. The, you know, the whole evolutionary process of the survival of the fittest makes no sense if you look at the average person's selfless acts. The average person is capable of selfless acts. If they're capable of a selfless act, then the process of evolution based on the survival of the fittest doesn't make any sense. I believe there is evolution, but not based on survival of the fittest. It makes no sense because in reality, the majority of people on the planet are capable of selfless acts and particularly a mother or a father are definitely capable of selfless acts when it comes to their own children. They'll, so, they'll save their own children at their own expense. And not, not everyone, but some will. Just the fact that one does is proof that there must be more love. So the proof, the proof of one shows us that there's love Exactly. That's the capability of love within us, so therefore God must have a greater capacity for love. Exactly. So we can't measure it by the lack of love within others because we can see there's a capacity for a greater amount. Exactly. There's got to be a capacity of a greater amount of love in God. If, if the best of us is capable of a certain amount of love, then God's got to be capable of a greater amount. It makes logical sense. And this is why like the Bible says this about God. And when I get to the right verse, it says this about God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, that, that is in the Bible in First John 4 verse 8. God is love. 
Right? But the problem is, the Bible then goes on to contradict itself. Because this is what it says. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God. And do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among those who have believed. Yeah. How about another one? I think I've got another one. Um, yeah, here's a good one. That, by the way, was in First Thessalonians, Second uh, Thessalonians, one verses six to ten. For those who want to write that down, and this one, I've got the wrong verse there. I think I have to. This is the same God, another rule. Anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. <laughs> Exodus 21, verse 15. Oh, sorry, verse 17. Same God. So, the, uh, Second Thessalonians 1, verses 6 to 10. There's literally hundreds of verses I could have chosen, right? Now, so one verse is saying God is love, and then we have a contradictory verse, 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 to 10, which basically says that God's going to punish all the people who don't accept God and who don't accept God's truth. Now, firstly, again, it makes no logical sense. Because if you were an all-powerful being, why would you create a system where people can actually then go against you only if you're going to punish them for going against you. Does that make any sense to you? It's like, it's like setting people up to be murdered. Does that make logical sense to you that a God who is all-knowing and infinitely wise can create such a system where he will set you up so that you can actually go against his rules and regulations. But if you do go against his rules and regulations, you're going to die. And then, of course, of course, it's not death. It's eternally be eternally tormented for doing so. Now, does that actually make much sense to you? It makes no logical sense to me whatsoever. Right? So while I agree with the statement that God is love, I don't agree that God is punishing. And in fact, I suggest that love is never punishing. Love is more powerful an emotion than any other emotion and therefore does not need to punish. All right? And logically, God is far more intelligent than myself. I would definitely not create a system where a group of people could do the wrong thing and then I punish them for doing it. I would not logically do that, would you? So why do we think God would do it if we wouldn't do it? We're basically saying God's worse than us again, are we not? We're basically saying, yeah, we're up here, God's way down here in terms of the concept. And yet God was intelligent enough to create this body that I, have no, that I know nothing about and, and do not really understand its operation at all. And I don't certainly understand why life lives in it and then dies for some reason. I've got no understanding of that really. And, and all of these internal processes that man is just trying to discover, we can't even make the same body and yet we're saying that that God is less intelligent than ourselves and more unloving than ourselves. Now that does not make any logical sense either, does it not? Can you see 
where we're flawed in our reasonings. Liam, you wanted to ask a question? And then we'll go across to Tim. I was just going to say, but isn't that part there that you just talked about, showing people that their free will is you come with me or you die? That's the choice you make. Yeah, but I put to you that's not free will, <laughs> is it? But you can still choose death to die if you don't wish to go with the other person. But does not that sound like sort of like a genocidal maniac that it's we not, were saying? It's not much of a choice, I know. No. <laughs> And, and but doesn't it sound like you know? Doesn't it sound like someone like Stalin? Mm. Right? And what do we feel about Stalin? Do you feel he was a good bloke? You know, nice, friendly, open, nice, loving fellow. No. Well, he killed forty million people at least that we know about. Generally, that's the some assumed figure. Nobody really knows the total figure. More than God killed in the Bible. Well, God only killed two point four million. That are recorded, but that's without including the extermination of the whole human race in the day of Noah. So, if we add the day of Noah to it, we might find the figures are very similar or perhaps even exceed Stalin's. Right? And if that's the case, then, then what we're basically saying is God is like Stalin, <laughs> which is an interesting logical assertion, but doesn't make much sense. Can I just ask one more? Sure. When people, um, the powers that be, put the books of the Bible together, mm -hmm. would they have chosen the, all the books that have been left out, like the apocryphal mm -hmm. books, do they show that God is a more, they have more, God is more loving in those books than he is in the ones that have been included in the Bible? Well, some do and some don't. They were written by different people, therefore they had the slant of the person who wrote them and were influenced by spirits who, who often influenced the person writing. So some show more of a loving God and some show less of one. What is more the case is that the Bible books often were chosen by the priesthood in order to maintain control. So, so if, I contain, if I can have create a simple set of rules in which I can then state to you that certain things are not allowed and certain things are allowed and then the certain things that are not allowed are at the threat of death or eternal no, no sorry there's no such thing as death that's right so we've got to add this additional figure that eternal torment thereafter after death then then I can provide a lot of fear for you and there's a high likelihood that you will accede to my wishes which is I want you to pay me my tithe for delivering this information to you and keeping you under control. Mm. So it's a very funny system that when you think about it, you're paying somebody to keep you under control. Mm. And that's the church. The church is that often. That's why the reason why the church was created. And this was created well before. You, you could say that the Christian, a lot of the Christian rules and processes were all based on earlier processes that the, Jew, that the Jews had. So these were all present in my day. The, the priesthood was reliant on the gifts given to them from the people. So instead of just being relying on the gift, what they did instead was they ensured the gift would occur. So it's no longer a gift, it's now a payment. So what they did now, it's a bit like you do when you, I've seen you do this, where you go, oh, it's all available by donation, $10. I've seen this happen. In fact, the guys who were making up the communication team wrote, you, you, do, you actually did a, 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 a one that we didn't send out, thank, for, thank goodness. And they actually did a presentation where somebody says, this is all available for a $10 donation. Now, a $10 donation is not a gift. That is now a requirement. Right? Peter knows that I've had this discussion with him many times about, the, about that's why we're now doing our own DVDs, because of this same principle. Now, now the religions have placed a requirement. This is why they have this thing called a collection plate. They've gone through all different means. Firstly, they want to agree, and many religions historically went into the tithing system, which means you pay 10% of your wages to whoever. You imagine the amount of, if you've got like a million people paying 10% of their wages every week. A million people. That's, what's the average wage nowadays in Australia? 
should we say, let's be really tight and say it's 500 bucks a week, right? The average wage, right? If it's 500 bucks a week, then a tenth of that is 50 bucks and there's a million people. So what's that? Every week, 50 million bucks. Just with a million people. $50 million coming every week. What's that? A year? $2.5 billion a year just from Australians who practice all that one thing. Can you see high desire to maintain that if you're into money? And so religion has become a money-making exercise. Now, ironically, I get accused of becoming a money-making exercise just by having a donation box out the back under which none of you are under any pressure to donate. And I don't feel that, so I'm just providing you a means to give a gift if you wish, which I feel is a very different process than actually demanding it from you or tithing it from you. So, so what's the difference between myself and a person who's, say, a new age, like, what do they call them nowadays? No, no, sp speaker, you know, like a, not that I'm as good as many of them, but... Motivational speaker. Most motivational speaker. So what do they do? They have four or five hundred people come along, sometimes a uh, hundred people come along, and many of them charge, what, six hundred thousand bucks for the session? So, and, and, I, and I get condemned for putting a contribution box out the back. So that doesn't make much sense to me either. But it, it, what it does is illustrate how religion has, has determined itself to be. And, and basically there's one thing to remember in all this, which we'll talk about as an aside one day, is that there is the priesthood and then there are the prophets. The priesthood want to control, manipulate you and use your money. The prophets just want to tell you about God and what's going on with God and what you can do to connect to God and what you can do to bring your life into more harmony with love. So I'm one of these. But there are many, many millions of these <laughs> on the planet. There are very few of these. That's the reality. Now, the priesthood determined a lot of the rules. And they determined the rules because they wished to control. And that's a fact. Now, one way to control is to say that the almighty being of the universe has this system in place where if you do the wrong thing, you die, and then on top of that, you get tortured for the rest of your existence after your death. Now, you can see why many people are terrified, can't you, of God. Now, would you desire to connect to a God you're terrified of? No. And so what do they say? That you must fear God. This is in the Bible too, to fear God in many places. Because God is this punishing God who is going to not only kill you, should you be a wrongdoer, but he's going to take far more steps than that. He is going to torture you for the rest of your existence. Now, obviously, that God cannot exist because I wouldn't do it. And I don't care whether any of you would do it. The fact that one person, myself, would not do that means that God, that God cannot exist. Can you see the logic of that? If just one person on the earth would not do that, then it means that that particular God cannot exist. That God cannot do it either. So that's the, that's the fact. Let's go uh, to this free will discussion, shall we? The, the truth is that mankind is very confused about the gifts God has given us. So in uh, the New Age religion, it basically says that God gave us free will, right? Now, some of them say with consequences and some of them say with none. It just depends on how liberal they are. The ones who say it's with consequences, they call that karma. Right? 
And the ones that say there's no consequences and that everything is right, they of course don't have a name for it. <laughs> and then, what does the Bible say? Well, the very person who's giving this talk to you is often quoted as saying all sorts of things that he didn't say. But this one I'd like to read for you from in the book of John, chapter 6 and verse 38. It says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him that sent me. So in other words, the Bible is basically saying that you forget about your will. The leader of your religion said, not my will, but the will of him that sent me. Now, that is another false statement in the Bible. Right? I never said that, and I never am going to say it, because the reality is it is my will, and it was my will to continue teaching what I'm teaching. I desire to do it. Does that make sense? If I didn't desire to do it, I wouldn't do it, no matter what God told me. Right? But the Bible says that not my will, but God's will is the thing that we need to follow. So does this make much sense? Of course, it results in a lot of confusion. One form of religion is saying that God gave us free will, which means we're allowed to do anything we want. The other one is basically saying, yes, God gave us free will, but... When you don't do God's will, you get killed. So that doesn't now feel like free will anymore. That feels like more like one thing matters and that's all. And what's the truth? Oh, by the way, the Bible also says this. I'll just read this to you. This one is in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, this one's in Galatians 6, verse 7. It says this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So the one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit from that spirit will reap eternal life. So, so the Bible also says that uh, not only do we not follow our own will, but whatever we choose to do we, is going to have a consequence. And it's interesting. Like, we're not meant to follow our own will. But anyway, it's a bit confusing, but we'll leave the confusion there. So there's Galatians 6 verse 7. We've got John 6 verse 38. What's the truth? And remember, I'm saying to you that the truth can be tested. Right? So, and it's interesting when you talk to spirits because they've had a lot more opportunity to test, right, than often we have. And they all have an opportunity to tell you about the spirit world. So it's interesting when you talk to them because, and this is one reason why the priesthood don't want you to talk to the spirits. Because you might find out the truth about what it's really like. So, so I've talked to many Christian spirits who have ended up in what is called hell in the spirit world. But it's not a place of fiery torment. And they're immediately confused. Because they're in a place where they feel terrible, but there's no fire and there's no Satan. And they don't understand. And then when you talk to spirits who believe that God gave us free will, this sense of karma... Uh, this, and there's a sense of karma that, you know, what, what you sow you will reap. They then talk to you and they find themselves in a bit better condition generally because they have realised that the actions they take that are unloving have an unloving consequence. But unfortunately for many of them, they didn't realise what love was because they had the world's definition of love, as we talked about yesterday, and so they're reaping the consequence of actions they thought were loving but were actually unloving. And so many of them have a big distress about that. So what's the truth about God? Well, God gave us free will. I feel that is definitely a truth. This can be tested. 
There's a but. Every action that we take in harmony with love has a positive consequence on our soul. And every action that we take out of harmony with love has a negative consequence on our soul. We have free will, but there is a consequence to every action we take. And when I say we have free will, we're allowed to believe different things than the truth. And some of those beliefs might have a negative consequence and some might not have a negative consequence on our soul. It just depends on what our actions are that we took that became unloving as a result and the different feelings that we had as a result. So God gave us free will. We can test this. Exercise your free will. And this is a very logical thing to do, right? Does God punish a negative exercise of your free will? You all know the answer. How do you know the answer? Because you've experimented with this in your own life and no fire came down out of heaven and punished you when you did something that you knew to be wrong. Is that not true? Sometimes you were waiting for it. You go, ah, it didn't happen. And then because we think it didn't happen, we go and do the next thing wrong. And the next thing wrong, because the, tr the truth is that God is not punishing every deed like that. That's the truth. But there is a belief that they're building up in the Christian faith, that they're building up to the day of judgment, when all of those deeds that have gone unpunished will now be punished. Now, does that make much logical sense to you either? Does it make logical sense to you that something would be punished when like, the deed was like 50 years ago. Like, you imagine doing this with your own child. Right? Your child does something wrong. And let's say you've given to giving your children a smack every time they do something wrong. Your child does something wrong. And then seven years later, you decide, now's the time to give them a smack. So you give them a smack. And they say, what's that for? That was for what you did seven years ago. Does that really help the child be corrected or change? Does that sound logical to you? But that's what Christians are suggesting God does. Exactly the same thing as that. Does that make sense? What I'm suggesting is that there is a consequence on the soul that is immediate. Is that me losing my battery? There is a consequence on the soul that is immediate, but it's not a physical consequence. It's a consequence in the soul's pain. So when the soul experiences some pain, it's the result of an action that was taken that was out of harmony with love. And when the soul experiences pleasure, um, it can be the result of the soul experiencing something that was now harmonious with love. When I say, I say can be, because it could also be the soul experiencing something that's an addiction and enjoying itself in the process. And I put to you that at the soul level, that's not really feeling a feeling of joy anyway. Now, God gave the free will, and so we have this system in place. God has this system in place, which is a very intelligent system. If you think about it, we can look at the things God does and analyse it a bit through intelligence as well, can't we? Like, does it make sense for him to do this other thing? Punish somebody 50 years after they did the deed? Does that make sense to you? Would you do it? No. Most of us want to punish the person immediately, do we not? Yeah. So if God was the rageful God he's portrayed to be, surely he should be punishing it immediately too, should he not? Surely that would make sense. So again, these statements cause the world's definition of what God is or what God does is very, very limited and causes us then to go into this place where, we, where we're more uncertain about the truth. And this is the problem with a lot of the presentations of the holy books and so forth. Now, um, it's getting near time to have... Oh, well, it's well and truly past time to have something to eat, isn't it, really? Um, I didn't realise I'd been going for two hours on this subject. Um, so, so what I'd like to do at this point is have a break and then I'd like to talk to you about more of the things that are part of God's nature that cause confusion on the planet about God and, and what God does. And then what we want to do is have a bit of a summary at the end about this presentation because there are many more presentations. This is just session one of this subject. 
and there are many more presentations I would like to give about the discrepancy between the world's belief systems about God and what logically can only be God's true nature if God does exist. So let's have a break for 45 minutes, shall we? And then proceed.